Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this panel on Justice Breyer's legacy after four decades on the bench. Um, my name is Micah Schwartzman. I'm the director of the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy at the University of Virginia School of Law. The Karsh Center is a nonpartisan legal institute whose mission is to promote the understanding and appreciation of principles and practices necessary for a well-functioning pluralistic democracy, including civil discourse, civic engagement and citizenship, ethics and integrity in public office and respect for the rule of law. Today, to discuss Justice Breyer's retirement and his many years of service within the federal judiciary, we have a panel of four former clerks who teach at the University of Virginia School of Law. Let me briefly introduce them before turning things over to Dean Reese Segalyaboff, who will be our moderator for today. First, we're fortunate to have with us Judge Vince Chabria, who is a lecturer at the law school. Judge Chabria is a federal district court judge in the Northern District of California, based in San Francisco. Before joining the bench in 2014, he was chief of appellate litigation in the San Francisco attorney's office, a deputy on the government litigation team, a member of the city attorney's uh, affirmative litigation task force. Um, judge Chabria clerked for Justice Breyer at the Supreme Court in the 2001 term. Next, I'm happy to introduce Risa Galyaboff, who is Dean of our law school and the Arnold H. Leon Professor of Law and Professor of History. She's the author of two prize-winning books, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights and Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and the Making of the 1960s. Dean Galyaboff is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the American Law Institute, a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and I should mention host of the UVA Law School podcast, Common Law. She also clerked for Justice Breyer in the 2001 term. Dean Galyaboff is joined by Rachel Harmon, who is the Harrison Robertson Professor of Law, the class of 1957 Research Professor of Law and Director of UVA's Center for Criminal Justice. She's a member of the American Law Institute and author of an important new casebook, The Law of the Police. Before entering the academy, Professor Harmon served for eight years as a federal prosecutor in the US Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. She clerked for Justice Breyer in the 1997 term. Our final panelist is Dan Ortiz, who is the Michael J. and Jane R. Horvitz Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of UVA's Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. Professor Ortiz has published widely on election law, civil procedure, constitutional law, and legal theory. As director of our Supreme Court Clinic, he's argued numerous cases before the Supreme Court and with an enviable win-loss record. Professor Ortiz clerked for then Judge Breyer on the US Court of Appeals for the First, First Circuit and then for Justice Lewis Powell at the Supreme Court of the United States. Let me now turn things over to Dean Galyaboff, who will be moderating our panel today. I'm really glad that you all are here, uh, and I appreciate all of our panelists being willing to do this at such short notice. I'm really happy that this event came together. I have always felt incredibly lucky to have clerked for Justice Breyer and to know him, uh, and so lucky to have so many UVA faculty who share that experience, uh, including my co-clerk Vince Chabria, who is, uh, as Micah said, a judge in San Francisco. Um, and I'm excited today to explore his legacy as a judge, as a boss, as a person uh, with, uh, with my colleagues. So uh, we were excited to do this in part, you know, the news cycle moves quickly and it moves from retirement to nomination to the future the court, um, but we are an institution of higher learning. We can pause and take a bit uh, more time on the legacy part. Uh, and I know that you know our students spend a lot of time in law school reading the opinions of the court and it's not every day that a justice steps down and we have an opportunity to really explore the oeuvre uh, that he wrote and place him in a larger judicial and personal context. So I'm excited to do that today. I thought we would start off this morning with just general reflections from each of our panelists uh, about the justice. Then I'll ask the panelists a few more specific questions and then open it up to Q&A. So please use the Q&A function on the Zoom screen uh, to post your questions uh, for the last portion of the event. Um, so for reflections, we'll start with you, Rachel. Thank you, Dick um, Algebaf. Well, I, I assume today that we're mostly going to be talking about Justice Breyer as a jurist, um, though all of us have a personal relationship with him. And I think I wanted to start by saying something on the personal side, because that maybe won't be in the papers as much um, as, as some of his more important opinions. Um, I think that since my clerkship, Justice Breyer has served as my clearest role model for how to live a full and meaningful life. Um, of course, we'll talk about his cases, and he devoted an enormous amount of energy 
Um, he worked extremely hard. Um, but even before he devoted his intellect to the bench, he made contributions as an academic, an administrative law scholar, as a teacher that remain relevant today. And many of you may have touched on them in law school. And, and before his time at Harvard and during his time at Harvard, he re repeatedly returned to public service, including at DOJ and at the Senate Judiciary Committee. And it just felt to me like as I was starting my career to look upon this man who had taken every opportunity to use uh, an incredible uh, intellectual capacity for um, serious reflection and public purposes. Um, I clerked in his third year at the Supreme Court, and what struck me maybe most about that year and in my relationship with him since on the personal side, especially in those first few months when I was working nights and weekends, was that he was working incredibly hard, but he was living remarkably well too. He always stayed good humored and optimistic. He was really and is a joy to be around. He was incredibly devoted to his wife, to his children, now to his grandchildren. Um, he had valued friendships that have lasted for decades. He was excited by new plays and movies and books and museum exhibits and ideas. And he constantly wanted to learn something new. So while I was clerking, he was listening to audio tapes all the time, trying to learn Spanish. Um, I found his intellect and energy and passion singular. He lives a life and a half in the same 24 hours that the rest of us try to do one. Um, but his enthusiasm for life and the fullness of his life, even if I can't live up to his example, has been an inspiration for me. And I, I guess I think it's worth reflecting on that hum human aspect of his uh, legacy as well as his cases. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Dan. I'd like to camp on everything that uh, Rachel said. Every, you know, the thing that's most remarkable about him is how many different things he could do and how many different things he was completely successful uh, at. You know, unlike most of us who toil in one little corner of the legal field, uh, Stephen Breyer uh, worked everywhere with great success. You know, he was in government, legislature, he was in, uh, worked for the Senate. Uh, he worked for DOJ at various times in the Sentencing Commission. He was a judge and then a justice. You know, he's been everywhere. And one of the things that most animated him, as Rachel uh, indicated, is his uh, all-consuming interest and enthusiasm for learning new things, having new experiences, and bringing other people uh, along with him. Uh, many of the ways that I've grown, uh, both professionally and personally, have been due to experiences, challenges uh, that Justice Breyer uh, laid out uh, for me personally and for you know, people more generally uh, working in the field. I think one of his most intellectually animating concerns is very important for him and it's continuous between his work as a judge and a justice and also uh, his work as a writer and a teacher is his central concern with government, uh, both in how it works uh, as Rachel mentioned, his uh, deep work in administrative law. And he was a real administrative law nerd, uh, but that was because he saw how much it mattered, why it mattered, and how it made a difference to everyone's uh, lives. Uh, he was also very interested in democracy writ large. He's written books, and you can see that in a lot of his election law opinions. Unfortunately, he found himself in dissent in uh, most of them, uh, but I think that those dissents will have a lot of durability and will, there will be people after he leaves the court, like Justice Kagan, who will be taking the baton and running even further with it. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Vince. Yeah, picking up on the public servant uh, theme uh, and the, the concern for government, where, where does it come from? Um, I think part of it comes from his family background. So it's, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, Justice Breyer grew up here in San Francisco. By the way, thank you for having me. It's nice to be back at UVA, sort of. And uh, hopefully I'll be back for real uh, next year to, to teach another class. Uh, but anyway, uh, Justice Breyer, he grew up here in San Francisco. His father was a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. His, uh, excuse me, his grandfather. His father 
was uh, general counsel for the San Francisco Unified School District. Worked there for, for many, many years. And in fact, the, the boardroom at the school district is called the Irving G. Breyer uh, boardroom. Um, his mother was active in League of Women Voters. His aunt Shirley was a union activist. And so, and his brother, of course, was a prosecutor and is now a federal judge. And, and so I think from a young age, he, he came from a public facing family and was thinking about these issues. And I think it's really animated his jurisprudence. Um, I, I think that's largely where his concern comes from for uh, making sure that the law works for ordinary people and making sure that the law works for the public officials who are trying in good faith to solve society's problems. Um, briefly, you know, you, you all talked about the influence that Justice Breyer has had on you. Obviously, I'm a district judge, and so I feel his influence every day in the work that I do. Um, one, of, one thing, of course, is, you know, being practical about the law, using common sense and making sure that the law is actually working for people and helping them solve their problems instead of getting in the way. Um, another is uh, transparency. Um, you hear a lot about his goofy hypotheticals from the bench, but what, what you hear less about is that he really made an effort to write his opinions clearly and make them understandable, not just for the sophisticated lawyer who knew the ins and outs of the case, but somebody who might be new to the case and trying to familiar them, familiarize themselves uh, with it. Um, and then finally, I won't talk at length about this right now. I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss it more later. But his commitment to diversity, his longstanding commitment to diversity, not just in his jurisprudence, but in his hiring practices. Um, and like I said, I'll leave it there for now. And hopefully we can chat more about that a little bit later. Great. I fully expect us to come back to that later. Uh, and so I hope we will. Um, I will say uh, welcome to everyone, Vince, uh, especially uh, to you coming from uh, the outside and especially wearing your UVA t-shirt that uh, that gives us all a lot of pleasure here. So well, you, get, you gave me this T-shirt, so. yeah. <laughs> even the more so. And if, if for those of you who weren't listening really closely uh, to Micah Schwartzman's introductions, uh, Vince and I were co-clerks. We were not only co-clerks; we shared an office together. Um, we spent many, many, many more hours uh, with each other that year than with uh, our spouses or or anyone else. Um, so, uh, so, and we were sitting there together during 9/11. We were sitting there together during 9-11. Uh, we were, uh, and that was that was a, a terrible day. Um, and we were there. Um, I was going to say something else about that, Vince, though, that was more <laughs> uplifting. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, anyway, oh, there's a there's a photo of our turn that seems to be like in Getty photos and gets pulled out all the time. Um, a black and white photo of the justice talking to some clerks, and Vince is in the foreground, and I'm in the background, and a, a third of our co clerks, Mira Horowitz, is back there too. Um, Mike Leiter, the only one not in the photo, um, but we remember you always, Mike. And that, Risa, was the only time you were in the background and I was in the foreground. <laughs> I don't think that's true, Vince. Um, so I would just add, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's remarkable about the justice is we all have a very similar vision of him, and that's because he is who he is. And, uh, and so that's not a surprise. But I would just add... Um, you know, I think he's full of, of paradoxes and contradictions. So, you know, as Vince was saying about the hypotheticals, he's incredibly pragmatic and fact oriented and, pra and practical, but he's also incredibly academic uh, and theoretical and, you know, kind of the, the absent minded professor with the hypotheticals. Um, he's incredibly erudite and learned. He taught himself how to read French. Uh, he taught himself French by reading Proust. Um, uh, and at the same time, you know, he's incredibly human. Uh, and he, you know, rode his bike to the court for many years. Um, uh, though I think Rachel was nodding. Those are Rachel's years, I think. Is that right, Rachel? And the marshals hated it. <laughs> they really didn't like that at all. Um, I actually was going to echo something else you said, which is you said he is who he is. The people have many, many times said, well, what is Justice Breyer really like? And I say, oh, no, no, no. When you see him on television, that is who he is. That's what he's always like. I, I think that's actually more so about him than almost anyone I've ever known. He is always himself in a totally thorough way. I could not agree more. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like 
yeah, I agree. Okay, we could share more on that uh, on that later. So okay, so let's be let's be a little more academic. Take a, a view of the the judging for a little bit, and then we'll come back to the um, the personal uh, anecdotes at the end. So um, so you know, twenty seven years on the bench, and I would say another kind of paradox. He was a frequent dissenter during all of that time, and yet he is an irrepressible optimist um, uh, and continues to be so. Um, that's a lot of cases, that's a lot of time. I'm curious what each of you sees as kind of the justice's most important or signature or interesting opinions or maybe a favorite or a lesser known opinion from your term, um, any kind of opinion uh, that you wanna share with everybody. So Vince, why don't we start with you? Sure, well, we've been hearing a lot about the dissents, but um, as, a, as a district judge who sentences people regularly, I thought I would talk about one of his majority opinions, um, and that is uh, his opinion in the United States versus Booker uh, involving the sentencing guidelines. And just to go back, um, I'll, I'll try to do this briefly, but there was a time when federal judges had virtually limitless discretion to sentence people. Um, there might be a statutory maximum, there might be a mandatory minimum sentence, but that was it. And, and you know, you had, uh, this was before my time, but you had discretion to sentence people within that. And so, the, you know, the, the sentence you got really often depended on the judge you got, and it could vary wildly. And people ultimately realized in the 1980s, I think that that was not a good idea, not a good thing. And so the Sentencing Commission was created uh, by Congress, and Justice Breyer, then Judge Breyer, was appointed to the Sentencing Commission. And what the the commission did is created guidelines for federal judges that were guidelines that were binding on federal judges um, and requiring them to find certain facts. And if they found those facts, uh, the defendant needed to be sentenced within a particular range prescribed by the guidelines. So fast forward um, to, uh, and what that did is it uh, eliminated sentencing disparity. It had some of its own problems though. So fast forward to when Justice Breyer was on the Supreme Court, there was a constitutional challenge to the sentencing guidelines. And the, the challenge was basically, you know, we can't have judges finding facts that result in an increase in the defendant's sentence. The jury has to find those facts. It's a Sixth Amendment violation of the judge find those facts. And so a different majority of the court in United States versus Booker struck down the, the mandatory aspect of the guidelines, said that you know the, uh, a defendant's sentence can't be increased based on the factual findings of a judge um, so long as um, the, uh, the, the increased sentence is mandatory. Well, these are, this was Justice Breyer's baby, right? So he pulls together a different majority of the court um, and the question is, well, is there anything left of these guidelines? And Justice Breyer's majority opinion um, said, okay, well, the, the, the provision of the guidelines that, that um, requires judges to increase a sentence based on factual findings not made by the jury is unconstitutional, but the way to um, sever that provision and make it most consistent or least inconsistent with Congress's intent is to say that the remaining, uh, the remainder of the guidelines are advisory and judges are required to consider the guidelines as a starting point when they are deciding how to sentence a criminal defendant. They can deviate from that. They're not required to increase somebody's sentence based on a, a particular factual finding contemplated by the guideline, but they are advisory. And so he sort of was involved in the creation of the guidelines and then wrote the opinion that saved the guidelines from extinction really and has left us, I think, with the best of all possible worlds because the judges have discretion um, to consider particular facts to go up or down, but they're not bound by it. Um, yet at the same time, because we have to consider the guidelines, our sentences are to a certain degree data-driven and take into account what other people are getting sentenced to by other judges around the country. So I think that's been a very important, both his time on the commission and his Booker opinion has been a very important contribution. Am I right, Vince, that um, that that the majority and the dissent or the concurrences in the in in Booker and and those cases? I remember from our term Apprendi, there was Almodores Torres, all these cases, right? Starting 
back, Rachel, when you were there, um, uh, th that was a different 5-4 grouping than the normal one. Rachel, do you want to talk about that? Or I can go back to Vince. Okay, go ahead, Vince. I'm happy to say something briefly about it, which is, yes, they were, they were different majorities. And Justice Ginsburg was in the majority in both cases. Um, in uh, the opinion striking down the mandatory aspect of the guidelines and Justice Breyer's opinion preserving the remainder of the guidelines as advisory. And, and you know, I wasn't there, but I can picture, we all know Justice Breyer, right? And he, you, you can imagine that he thought of 30 different ways to present this to Justice Ginsburg to explain to her why it was important to you know, sever the, the mandatory provision in that way. And I don't know what, I have no inside knowledge about what happened, but I can assure you that he worked really hard uh, talking to Justice Ginsburg about that. I was actually a prosecutor when Booker came down, though I had been there when Almondar's Torres, one of the precursors to Booker was decided. But as a prosecutor, you know, Booker threatened to upend the entire federal prosecution system. I mean, the criminal justice system was going to be in total disarray. And, and Justice Breyer's opinion um, maybe uh, certainly did not preserve the status quo. Uh, I think Vince is right about that. But it definitely allowed the system to continue with some principles in place um, uh, and maybe you can have uh, criticisms about the way um, federal sentencing happens. Um, surely uh, many people do, um, but I think he he left uh, something intact that was both meaningful and, and true to the principles that it was intended to um, uh, preserve. Do, do either of you or Dan have a view of, you know, is that actually the right place to be, right? So we went from a world where there was so much discretion and it was so inflected with both discrimination and arbitrariness to a much more rigid world of the sentencing guidelines. I mean, is am I being Pollyanna to say maybe the sentencing guidelines as advisory is actually a good medium place between too much discretion and too little or thoughts? Well, I, I will say that, uh, you know, I think if you talk to the vast majority of federal judges, they would say that this is the best system um, because it, with the, you know, the first system, total discretion, boundless discretion, uh, I think a lot of judges probably felt a, a little bit lost or should have felt a little bit lost if they didn't. And um, I think that with the mandatory guideline system, judges correctly felt um, shackled um, and unable to you know, go down or up as the facts may have called for it. And like I said, this system, you know, it is grounded in something. It's grounded in sort of a system of rules. that are advisory rules, but they put us at a starting point. And then, but it's just a starting point and we're allowed to consider particular factors and go up or down based on, you know, a particular defendant's situation. So I think, and I think the majority of judges think it's the best of both worlds. How about prosecutors, Rachel? Well, I, I think prosecutors definitely prefer a guideline system to a non-guideline system in part because it gives them uh, some predictability and outcomes, which helps with negotiations. The many, I think sometimes the criticisms of the Sentencing Commission's work and in particularly the guidelines as a structure uh, were not about the process or sometimes have been about a process, but were about the anchoring effect it had at a very high level. So that the sentences were simply too harsh. And I think, you know, one of the lessons Justice Breyer, among others, learned um, from the, the effort to develop the guidelines was that process wasn't everything, that the, that the, that when we filled in the, the numbers, um, it ended up having a big impact on human lives. And so um, it's hard to talk about, is this the best system without unpacking those numbers? Um, but I do think that Vince's points about the, the allowing judges meaningful discretion have been very important um, in um, it actually uncovering some of the problems with the numbers themselves, because it allows judges to point out some of the problems with the system. Great. I have I have no idea whether it's the best system or not, but I think it reveals something very interesting about Breyer that we haven't talked about yet. 
which is that it shows his concern for the court as an institution and the way he often tried to triangulate between the court and other players. I uh, you know people think of him as an academic and he wasn't political, but he was chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee under uh, Senator Kennedy uh, for a while. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Vince and Rachel, but I seem to remember that the original political constituency for the mandatory sentencing guidelines were a lot of people in Congress and elsewhere, basically outside the judiciary, who thought, looked at the kind of discrepancies in sentences and were horrified by it. And what, one of the things you can see Breyer doing is trying to bridge that divide, reaching out in the compromise he made getting Ginsburg, I guess, on board to end up with a system that would that the judiciary could work with reasonably well, at least, but also would make the outside constituencies feel not very, not badly done by. Yeah, I think we'll, and, and I, the, the institutionalist and, and the kind of consensus building, I think we'll definitely come back to you. Uh, in, in a minute as well. And I think you're right to point it out um, here. Um, so Dan, uh, how, about, uh, how about you? What case or cases would you uh, highlight from his time on the bench? Well, I, I, I would highlight his election law cases, but there's one in particular, which is a very big case, uh, but it's not one where his opinion in the case has ever really been thought to be very important. But I think it really reveals a lot about him. And in a sense, it could have been a booker but it wasn't. Uh, and that case is Bush versus Gore. And people remember the election uh, between Bush and Gore. And it came back to the Supreme Court second time and the Supreme Court famously halted the counting of the ballots in Florida and basically said everyone had to go uh, home. Uh, there was a per curiam opinion uh, representing the views of five justices, which everyone thinks was uh, written mostly by Justice Kennedy. And Breyer wrote a dissent and the first part of his dissent was joined by only one justice, which was odd because usually the justices all joined in the case, joined each other's dissents to sort of the liberals one to sort of, you know, put up a united front as the conservatives did. Uh, but uh, Justice Breyer only got one other justice in the first part of his dissent, and he got all the, he got three others uh, on the second. And what he did, I think, was he tried to make an attempt to get, if I'm reading it right, who knows, because the files won't be available for some time. But it looked like what he did is he, he took a position which I can't believe he thought really defensible himself, but which he tried to use to uh, create some distance between Justices Kennedy and O'Connor and the other three conservatives. Uh, and that was to say that, yeah, there might well have been a violation. Probably the original draft of the opinion said that there was a violation of liability. This violated the Equal Protection Clause. But, and then the second part of the opinion, which all the liberals joined, he said, but the remedy here is completely wrong. You should continue to count uh, the ballots. You shouldn't just stop uh, counting. And I think it was an attempt to try to offer something to the people on the other side to try to pry a few of them, enough to get a majority over to his side, which he generally thought was what the constitution required and what would be good for the country. And the fact that it was a dissent indicates that it failed. Uh, maybe Justice Kennedy snookered him uh, at uh, some point. You know, He thought that there might have been some chance of getting Justice Kennedy over and it just never happened. I wouldn't be surprised as you know, Vince describes that there weren't uh, a lot of discussions between Justice Kennedy and uh, uh, Justice Breyer during the pendency uh, of this case. But I think you know, his attempt to do that, to actually swallow something that he probably didn't believe on liability to end up somewhere that he thought would be right on remedy, uh, shows a lot about him. And again, it shows him institutionally trying to reach out to other, place, uh, to other players to put together a coalition that to his mind would do the right thing legally. I think that was partly possible because he was humble. That is to say, he believed he might well be wrong. And so he was more willing to reach compromise as a result of that. I, I think, I, I think yeah. that's right. 
I was going to say, I think that's right too. And, you know, when he, he was here a few years ago and before COVID and spoke to our students and one of the students asked him about collegiality and consensus building and how do you have, you know, conversations across difference. And he, his answer was, you look in the mirror uh, and you start with yourself. And, you know, he said, of course, I think I'm right. Everyone thinks they're right, but, but you have to listen and you have to be open to the fact that you might not be right. Cause we all think we're right. And maybe we're not all right. Um, and he said, he said, and you can't pretend people know if you're pretending, if you're not really listening and you're not really considering what they say, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, but he also said, and I, you know, I think this goes to how often he dissented, even in Bush v. Gore, you know, you know, it's not that he had no principles. It's not that he didn't have a sense of, you know, he, he was looking for common ground. He was open to common ground. He wanted common ground, but he also very much had a sense of when that wasn't possible and, and when your principles, you know, prevent you from getting there that I, I think is really important. Yeah. And I was, I was going to say, I, uh, Dan, I think that that case is an example of him trying to find common ground in a way that would work for our democracy. Right, and that was was consistent with his vision of the relationship between the court and our democracy. But there were a lot of times, he says, you're alluding to, where you know he would not be a compromiser, not be a quote unquote pragmatist um, in that in that sense of the word, um, because uh, the court was doing something that he believed was an anathema to. Um, you know, our democracy and, and, uh, and, uh, and inconsistent with the need uh, for the law to get out of the way of public officials who are trying to do their job in good faith. Rachel, uh, what cases do you want to talk about? Well, the one thing I was going to say, you said he really genuinely believed in listening. And there was also a flip side of that which he genuinely believed that others would listen to. So he mm -hmm. treated everyone as if they would be receptive to persuasive arguments and dialogue. And I remember my term, Justice Thomas would tease him about that. Like, oh, you're so naive to think I'm actually going to change my mind in this dialogue that you want to have. But Justice Breyer never lost that optimism about anyone. So we recall times, Rachel, very similar where, you know, somebody would come up with an idea about a case and Justice Breyer would say, oh, that's good. That's really good. I'm going to go talk to Nino. And he would, he would go down the hall to, to share this great idea with Justice Scalia thinking it's going to convince him, right? And, um, uh, so, you know, in thinking about his legacy, I think much of the conversation in the public eye is going to be on the significant opinions in divided cases and for obvious reasons. But I think as a clerk and, and subsequently as a lawyer, the, the, some of the things that mattered to me or some of the things that influenced me were different. So I'm going to speak on behalf of one of his most probably most obscure decisions. Um, you know, I didn't clerk in a blockbuster term. I, 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 there were some cases, um, but I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do public interest law and his public interest facing, his public facing career and his commitment has been suggested to making the law work for individuals mattered to me. And some of my most compelling moments during the term were watching him work through the big and small criminal law and criminal procedure cases. Sometimes he never wrote opinions in, one, in them, but one of the ones that actually shaped my thinking about him and also I think about my career choices was a case called Gray versus Maryland. And in Gray, there was a na man named Bell who confessed, confessed to participating in a deadly beating and he implicated Gray, who was his co-defendant. And they were tried jointly and a judge permitted a redacted version of Bell's confession to be introduced at trial um, with Gray's name su substituted for the word deleted. So every time Bell uh, talked about Gray in the confession that the agent would read the word deleted in the testimony. And that in the mind of the lower courts satisfied what was known as the Bruton rule, which prohibited the use of a confession by one defendant as evidence against a co-defendant in the same trial, because doing so effectively allowed the confessing defendant to serve as a prosecution witness against the co-defendant without allowing him to be cross-examined as required by the Sixth Amendment. 
Now, the, the Bruton case decided that, and then in a subsequent case, the Supreme Court had allowed a redacted confession, which really prevented you from um, knowing that the co-defendant even existed. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't revealing. Um, and the lower courts used that subsequent case to engage in a practice of admitting confessions that at best fulfilled the letter of the Bruton rule, but were far from protecting Sixth Amendment light, rights because they allowed these redactions that didn't fool anyone in which everyone knew that one defendant was pointing the finger at the other defendant. And we just had to substitute the word defeated, de deleted for his name. And the reason why courts were doing this is because uh, well, it was partly to allow joint trials, which were judicially efficient, and the admission of the confessions, which the prosecutors wanted to continue, okay? And Justice Breyer's opinion didn't raise any ire or generate any dissents. It's a unanimous opinion for the term. It's lawyerly, it's brief, and it's clean. And yet, he manages to capture the real consequences of what happens at trial and the way that legal rules can be used to you know, uh, basically um, hide what's really going on and deny people their rights within the letter of the law. So he recognized, he was explicit, the jurors wouldn't have the slightest doubt about what was being deleted and that, and, and the, therefore this couldn't be used to bypass the Sixth Amendment principle. And he effectively, in doing so, ended what was a self-dealing lower court practice um, that allowed judges and prosecutors, I think, to have meaningfully evade the prior decisions. So why did this matter to me? Well, in law school, I had studied only big cases. Um, and Gray basically helped me firm up my interest in the small law, in the ways that criminal cases, the kinds that Vince decides every day, matter to individual lives. And the role of the law, including in the Supreme Court, of shaping those trials and those decisions. And it was just a couple of weeks after that the court decided that case that I accepted a position as a prosecutor at DOJ in the Civil Rights Division and, and have been interested in small law in some way ever since. That was wonderful. I, I did not know that story. Uh, yeah, I've known you all these years, but I didn't know that that was uh, influential for you. And, and I think that does so capture something, right? He understood how it worked and he understood the human consequences. And uh, that, that's, that was a great story. Um, so I, I'll add one, uh, I'll add one, which is uh, his dissent in Parents Involved uh, versus Seattle School. So that's the case where um, uh, there were local school districts in both uh, Seattle and Louisville who were using some uh, race-based decision-making in order to <laughs> maintain integrated school districts. So uh, it, it, school districts were resegregating uh, and these were school districts that were trying to retain uh, integrated schools and the majority of the court uh, uh, found constitutional violations in those efforts and said uh, you know, that, that that was discrimination on the basis of race in violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and Justice Breyer wrote uh, an unusually long and an unusually kind of rhetorical, um, but still very, you know, evidence-based and precedent-based, but but much more uh, uh, rhetorical than most of his opinions would be, and very impassioned. Um, and he really saw this as a defense of Brown in many ways. That what was really up for grabs here was. Um, how to think what equal, about what equality is in the United States and how do you get there? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and his view, you know, his clear frustration with the majority, um, you know, Justice Roberts writing for the majority says, you know, the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And I think Breyer really articulates um, there, you know, that that's not how he thinks about equality. And sometimes you might have to think about race in order to get to the kind of equality that 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 is a prerequisite for a democracy and uh, and is a prerequisite for the kind of pluralist society that he he thinks we should we should aspire to. Um, and I, I do think that uh, um, that the 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 case lays out in a very crisp way, you know, two fundamentally different visions about equality in the United States. And I think for for Justice Breyer, part of what 
was so important to him about this case is his own views about diversity, which I think we'll come back to again, as been suggested before, um, and his own views about uh, pluralism and equality. You know, he he grows up on the Warren Court. He clerks for Justice Goldberg um, on the Warren Court. He's you know works for Ted Kennedy. Uh, you know, I think he believes deeply in the kind of New Deal Warren Court settlement of the the mid to late twentieth century that. You know, you have a, a large regulatory government that um, that that regulates the economy that is involved, but you also have you know quite jealous regard for minority rights uh, uh, for the court, and um, and I think he saw that. Uh, at stake here, I think also, as been said earlier, um, you know, his 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 father worked for a school board, uh, and uh, and I think he has real faith in uh, in education and in you know most government officials most of the time, and you know he thinks you you have to give communities the tools that they need in order to govern, and that this was really taking from communities uh, you know a significant part of their toolbox in order to create the pluralist society that. Uh, that that the United States aspires to be, um, so so that's one I I would mention um, uh, that you know is obviously related to my own work and then and that I think was really close to his heart. Um, unless people want to talk more about specific cases, I'm happy to to talk more about jurisprudence or his role at the court more broadly. And I want to remind people um, if you have questions, you can put them uh, into the Q and A, uh, and and I can ask them of our panelists. Um, so can any I, other, uh, go ahead. Can I ask one question uh, of you, Risa, regarding sure. the Seattle uh, uh, schools case? Uh, you know, I I started thinking about that case again recently um, with the George Floyd. Uh, protests. Um, and, you know, uh, Justice Breyer's point was, you know, trying to eliminate racial isolation is different from trying to segregate people on the basis of race. And we have to let, this is a real problem, right? We have 330 million people in this country from all different races, and we're trying to figure out a way for them to be able to interact and you know, racial isolation is um, is an obstacle to that. And these school officials are trying to solve that. And we have to get out of their way and let them do it. Um, uh, you know, and, I, and you know, with the George Floyd stuff, I was thinking, you know, how can we expect a police officer to relate properly with different members of the community if they grow up in a racially isolated um, neighborhood? and in a racially isolated school where they never interact with people growing up of different races. I mean, is there any chance that, you know, sort of recent developments on the issue of race and our sort of relative awakening on some of the problems with respect to race that we have in this country will um, revive his, the point of view that he was expressing 13 years ago in that dissent? Uh, I mean, I think the question is revive among who. Uh, so, you know, I think there are a lot of people who would agree with him. And I, I think you're right that a lot of the themes that have come out of the uh, protests from the summer of 2020, spring and summer of 2020 and beyond are, are very much in keeping with the themes of his uh, of his dissent, right? The question about, you know, it's basically a, 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 a question about anti-discrimination versus anti-subordination, right? And the word equity, which I think has become far more prominent lately, um, is really a, a way of, of choosing one of those two, right? Of choosing the anti-subordination way of thinking about what equality is. Um, and that's the, you know, in, in earlier affirmative action cases, there have been, you know, debates among the justices and the majority and the sense about, well, do we know the difference between a, a welcome mat and a no trespassing sign, right? That's, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to forget who said that. I want to say Brennan, but I don't know if anyone remembers who that was. Um, but the, the um, you know, the question of whether all distinctions on the basis of race are equally situated vis-a-vis -vis the constitution or vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, uh, what you think society should be doing on a, on a moral level or whether um, whether there are, because there is inequality in the world, you have to think differently about how to, uh, how to, what you allow government to do in order to respond to that inequality. And I think, I think you're right, Vince. I think the justice thinks about how do people get along? How do they learn to get along? Uh, uh, you know, that, that 
you have to know people and you have to you have to have actual integration right i think he's an old school liberal in that way right in order for uh for you to have expectations that people are going to treat each other like human beings and um and i think you see that in in a lot of his religion cases too and you know the the voucher case from our term i don't know if you want to talk about that right he's very he's very aware of you know what's divisive and what's not divisive and and how do you encourage true pluralism and and tolerance across different groups of people yeah i mean just briefly to mention the, the the voucher case since you brought it up i think that was another example of him not being willing to compromise right and again you know, sort of focused on the fact that we have so many different people throughout this country of so many different religions and how are we going to uh you know make sure that they get along and that our country isn't torn apart by the religious strife that you saw in europe you know throughout this century 17th 18th century whatnot and um it, you know he sort of drew the line at you know government funding of religious education and his primary concern was that you know if you if government gets in the business of funding religious education you're going to start having people fight over that money and you're going to start having some groups feeling that they're they're being disfavored vis-a-vis -vis other groups and um it will create problems now i i happen to disagree with him on that case um and i would probably tell him that you know those voucher programs were upheld and we haven't seen the, the kind of strife that he was worried about but i think he would respond well you know sort of camel's nose under the tent and we need to take the 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 big picture view here and sort of the more that government becomes entangled with religion and religious funding and religious education, you know, the greater risk we are we are at. Dan, did you wonder, say that? Yeah, I uh, I wonder whether his openness to complexity and sensitivity to interest on all sides may have come with a cost, uh, though. I mean, certainly, some, you know, something I cheer on, and I think he captures that better than anyone else. Uh, on the court. But when you compare him to someone like Justice Scalia, you wonder whether, in a sense, that has gotten in the way of some of his legacy and has made him in some ways less effective than he might have otherwise been. When you read a Scalia opinion, and my God, you know, your heart starts pumping, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, and there's a kind of excitement there, and there's a, often a kind of uh, sharpness to it. This is the rule. You know, this is the position you take, whereas you read a Breyer opinion, often you come away with the feeling, you know, that's he, he really understands what's going on. But my God, it is so complicated that it's going to be hard to carry, do much with that, you know, have much of a legacy with that kind of approach. I just wonder if many of his virtues, if you will, also have come with a kind of cost to his reputation. You know, he's never going to, uh, I think, make people see, uh, seem as exciting to people as someone like Justice Scalia, who in some ways had a much more simple view, not only of law, but of the world. I think that's I think, right. Go ahead, I think, Rachel. I think that's really right. I think many of his strengths um, are also the, the uh, can be viewed as weaknesses. And both his humility and his attention to um, detail and reason and, and that his he tended away from the kind of sweeping rules that would have um, get, given him a, a um, maybe a more lasting impact as a voice. So, that's a good segue to a question about his jurisprudence, his role on the court, um, uh, uh, his 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 uh, thoughts about judicial role. Um, uh, happy since Dan and Rachel have started to weigh in. Vince, why don't we go to you, and then we can come back around. Yeah, I mean, I think that he was, uh, you know, in terms of judicial role. I mean, you saw from his speech uh, at the White House how. Uh, you know, deeply concerned he is about the relationship between, you know, the court and our democracy as a whole and society as a whole. Um, I think, you know, I'm not sure how, if people talk about this enough, but he was really somebody who thought that the, the court should stay in its own lane, right? I mean, he, 
you know, I remember there was a study from, you know, the 90s and 2000s where, um, you know, he voted to strike down, strike down a congressional enactment, enactment um, uh, less frequently than any of the other justices on the court. Um, and so, uh, you know, he cared a lot about uh, the court's legitimacy and part of preserving the court's legitimacy was staying in its own lane. Um, uh, and, you know, part of it was being pragmatic and making sure that the law was working for people and not sort of putting obstacles in their way. Um, and so I think that's one thing to, to um, emphasize about his view of the role of the court. You know, I, I work in an area in criminal procedure where sometimes he has uh, been criticized by liberals for not being liberal or consistent enough um, because he sometimes voted um, in criminal procedure cases for the government and divided opinions that expanded access to criminal evidence. Um, but I actually think that that, um, that his, his criminal procedure decisions illustrate some of his strength in it, something you mentioned, Risa, earlier, which is his faith in the, in the power of reasoned government and good intentions of government officials to be able, to, for the law to be able to do justice, that possibility um, informed of those decisions and something Vince just mentioned, which is humility about the role of the judge and the role of the court, um, it, uh, which is deeply connected to his belief in the power of democratic institutions um, and the idea that the rule of law uh, can do is important. So he, he wasn't someone who was willing to uphold constitutional commitments um, in the face of uh, decisions, you know, lower court decisions that um, uh, vitiated them. But but with this commitment to humility, to democratic institutions, to reason, to precedent, that I think you know, that to me, one of his biggest legacies is his optimism about the power of justice and the power of government um, in a society that maybe, you know, we haven't lived up to his, I hope we can justify it. I hope we can live up to it. Yeah. Dan? I, I think one of his greatest contributions uh, has been as a kind of a counterweight on the court to the majority who I think embody a kind of exclusive textualism. So, you know, many people talk about Justice Breyer's being very pragmatic with the kind of caveats that Vince has uh, suggested, but he really did look at details with sense of how rules would really work on the ground and was often sort of pulling various, perhaps sometimes incommensurables together. Uh, but above all, what he was really concerned with, I think, uh, especially in cases of statutory interpretation, but also some constitutional interpretation, was purposism. And he, I think, was horrified uh, genuinely that the court, or many on the court, uh, had lost sight of it almost completely, and just by following the words of the text. Now, I think, you know, certainly agrees that the words of the text will get you uh, some of the way there, maybe sometimes all the way there. But I think it seemed completely perverse to him that you would never try to think in interpreting saying what a statute meant, what Congress or the actor was trying to do, what was the purpose of the legislation. Now, of course, that it opened him up to criticism from people like Justice Scalia, who would say, well, the purpose, it's your purpose, it's not the purpose of the Congress, how can you ever sort of know that? And it's like a dog chasing its own tail, some of those uh, debates are uh, interminable. Uh, but I think it really is a perspective that's important to have. And I think that even the people who uh, expressly disagreed with him actually applied their exclusive textualism, as you will, off sometimes in a way which recognized the power of his arguments. Uh, but he was you know, a, a kind of lonely voice out there uh, for a while and things like just you know, statutory interpretation on the level of theory as opposed to what the results were on the ground. I want, that reminded me, Dan, of a, a conversation I had with Justice Breyer just a few weeks ago, actually, when he was in town. And we were talking about how to decide cases. And, and he said, you, you, in reference to the, the majority, this sort of Scalia majority, um, he said, you know, they view the law as chemistry. Um, 
And I, you know, I, I really disagree with that. And he, you know, invoked this image of somebody in a chemistry lab, you know, it's sort of isolated, isolated, sealed off chemistry lab where people are, you know, experimenting with different words and moving different words around and see which, you know, what, what hits. And, and, you know, I think that he, he you know, he used that word because he, he felt that we cannot view ourselves as sitting in an isolated lab. We have to think about the consequences of how we put these words together for the people who are affected by our decisions. Yeah, I would add to all of that. I think, you know, the word pragmatic has come up a couple of times and that's a word often used for him. And I, I think of it as operating on three different registers. So there's the the pragmatism of kind of consensus building and Dan, what you said earlier about, you know, yes, he's an academic, but he's also a savvy guy, right? And uh, and and so there's a pragmatism there. Um, there's the pragmatism in individual cases. I think this is what Rachel was talking about, you know, the, the seeing how the system works, right? Pragmatically saying like, how is this operating and how do we make it operate better for these people in this case, in this institution, in this system? Um, and then I think there's the pragmatism of, of the, this kind of consequentialism for the system of governance as a whole, right? He's interested in the consequences in particular cases and then the consequences in, um, in, in the system and in what role the judges are playing vis-a-vis -vis the political branches. And so I, I don't know if you all think of the pragmatism as linked to the consequentialism, I, I certainly do. Um, but then I would go back to, to some things that Rachel said, which is I, I always think, well, when you call it pragmatism, it, it sounds so kind of lowbrow, or you know, it, it sounds like it's um, it's it, it it denigrates other values that he also holds, and so I, I feel like pragmatic only gets you so far, and then you've got to talk about the optimism, Rachel, right? And you've got to talk about the humanism, which you also talked about, where like everybody knew they meant gray when they said delete, right? And this guy is not getting the trial that he is entitled to, and um, and I and I think when you put together the pragmatism with the optimism and the humanism, then you get a sense of kind of the whole picture of the world, you know, through, uh, through Breyer's eyes. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, Linda Greenhouse wrote a, a piece, I don't know if you all wrote about him, and she said sort of he was, he was the wrong man for this time, he was a man from another time. And you know, I don't know if I agree with that. But I do think, you know, his aspirations for our world, are really attractive ones, right? Like I, I, I want to aspire to be the world, as you said, Rachel, that you know that that he thinks we can be, and and that we and that we should be able to be. Okay. A anything more on the on the role in the court or the jurisprudence? I'm going to move on to the personal. I'll just say very briefly. He, you know, his his colleagues really liked him all across the spectrum. I and mean, when we were there, we set from from Justice Thomas to Justice Stevens and everywhere in between, they were very fond of him, respected him deeply. I um, could not. Yeah, but also knew that he was an honest broker, right? I mean, and that's part of why they were fond of him is, is he was such an honest broker. And so they didn't want to hear what they had to say. I mean, Justice Thomas might, you know, not uh, ultimately agree with him, but they wanted to hear what he had to say. And he, I think effect. that his presence with did effect. matter for the cases. Right. Sorry, what'd you say, Rachel? I said with affection. And you know, that's either when the justices disagreed with him when they didn't, you know, when they, they, they weren't persuaded by his deep insights or his reasons over rhetoric or or whatever. They they did it with affection. I think Vince is just yeah. right. But I think sometimes he did persuade them. I mean, I obviously we yeah. can share inside information, but there 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 were times where his, you know, his approach resulted in a change in the outcome of, of cases. So with affection, speaking about affection, uh, I think the affection that we had for him comes through as well. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm curious about um, any personal anecdotes that you uh, would like to share with the justice. Dan, I'll start with you. So this isn't something I witnessed myself, but it's a story that Justice Breyer tells about himself, which I think wonderfully illustrates, uh, Rachel, uh, Risa, something you said in your Slate piece, which you pointed to how, how he juggles intellectual humility and confidence at the same time. 
Uh, so we were sitting in uh, the clerks and Justice Breyer, uh, then Judge Breyer were sitting having lunch in chambers one day. And one of my co-clerks asked him, said, well, you know, what was it like making the move from Washington back to academia? And so he said, let me tell you, he says, this is wonderful. Let me tell you about it. My first day of work, I stepped into the Harvard Law School and I looked around this magnificent building and I said, Steve, you have really made it. This is everything you've really wanted to do. And then classes got out, people started moving around and all of a sudden I saw coming down the staircase Dean Erwin Griswold himself, who at that point had been Dean of Harvard Law School like 23 years something uh, years, very famous figure in just American law. And as he was coming down the, the steps, I was sort of looking at him and admiring him. And then he caught my eye and he seemed to be looking at me and he seemed to be approaching me as he came down the stairs. And I thought to myself, my first day at work, the Dean of Har Harvard Law School is gonna come down and greet me. And he walked right over to me and he said, young man, I have a desk that needs to be moved. Do you think you and some friends could come upstairs and move it for me? <laughs> and, you know, so it shows, you know, he, he was obviously very confident. He was very proud of himself, but he tells a story on himself to make fun of himself yeah. and to ridicule, you know, some of those perhaps pretensions uh, that he had. And I think that captures something very important about him. That's a wonderful story. I will say it also captures such a difference in um, time of how the Dean is perceived. I don't think anyone would be so excited <laughs> to have me walk toward them down the hall. <laughs> Hard to imagine. <laughs> um, but that is, that is a, a, a wonderful story. Um, Rachel. Dan, that story also echoes, we used to remember when he was here a couple of years ago, we had dinner with him and he was making fun of his questions at oral argument. He was telling the most ridiculous questions he had ever gotten trapped into asking by himself in oral argument in such a sweet and hysterical way. We were cracking up as he's saying, and then suddenly I'm talking about an oyster. And, and I, I really enjoyed it enormously, his sense of humor about himself. Um, so, you know, I don't know that this is an anecdote exactly, but uh, when I was clerking, um, I was a little distracted. Maybe I was less focused than my peers. It was the year of Monica Lewinsky's blue dress and Hillary Clinton's attorney client privilege assertion. And, uh, but my father uh, had advanced lung cancer and I was, I was sometimes maybe not it, it, as uh, 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 attentive as some of my peers. I think that would be fair. And Justice Breyer uh, could not have been more understanding. Um, and I, I, when my father was able to travel towards the end of the clerkship, um, he hosted my father in chambers for more than his usual tea. And the warmth and the generosity and the attention and the willingness to say nice things about me to my dad who was a middle school um, teacher who put himself through law school at night um, in his 40s. I, and, you know, me going to law school was one of the happiest things that had happened to him in his life. And that day at the Supreme Court um, it turned out to be one of the proudest days of his life. And he died just a few months later. So there weren't that many more. And I just remain forever grateful for um, uh, what he did. That's, it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, that's a, yeah. Vince? Yeah, um, a couple absent-minded professor stories, and hopefully, Risa, I'm not stealing yours, but um, uh, one story that has sort of been repeated over the years is from our year is, you know, there was one time when Justice Breyer um, wandered into the clerk's office and started talking about a case and you know, I just read this amicus brief and I think they have a real point and I think we need to look into this and uh, I'm also thinking about that and can you research it? And then the, the, the judicial assistant looked up and said, Justice, none of your clerks are here right now. Um, they're all outside uh, having lunch. And he says, oh, oh, okay, okay. And he goes out and joins us for lunch and, and, and talks to us about the case. And it's true that he, he had this 
kind of absent-minded professor quality about him. And I remember Chuck Breyer, his younger brother, you know, before I went to clerk for Justice Breyer, Chuck said, um, you know, my brother is going to seem like he's not paying any attention to you. And he, he wants to end the conversation, but I, I assure you, he's, he is paying attention to you and he doesn't want to end the conversation. And an example of that is, Risa, the, the Mike Leiter career advice story, right? Our co-clerk, Mike Leiter, who went on to become the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, um, the term ended and Mike wanted some sort of advice from Justice Breyer about how to sort of what the next step should be. So we got on the phone with Justice Breyer and the conversation was like Chuck's description of conversations with Justice Breyer, right? He seemed distracted. He kind of seemed like he was thinking about something else, wanted to get off the phone. And the conversation wasn't that helpful. And so, you know, Mike hangs up and he thinks, well, okay, I'm not clerking for him anymore. Maybe he, you know, is no longer interested in, in what I'm going to do. And, and then the next day, Justice Breyer calls back and says, Mike, I'm really sorry. I was distracted yesterday when we were talking. Can we please have the conversation over again? And that is him in a nutshell, although he sometimes is distracted. He really, really cares about the, the, the people in his life, and he's paying more attention than you think he is. Yeah, 100%. Rachel, you were laughing about the... You know, he used to walk out of the room talking and then walk back into the room in the middle of the same conversation. You'd be like, I, I missed something. Um, <laughs> or when he when I interviewed with him, it, 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 when he called me to offer me the job, he started in the middle of a sentence that was from the interview. Like we were, it was as if we were continuing the conversation. So I felt this constant sense of that we were in a, an extended conversation over time. He might miss something, you might miss something, but it would all be okay. <laughs> that is wonderful. I, when, uh, when he was here, I don't know if either of you noticed this, um, Rachel and Dan, when he was here a few years ago, um, and I was, I int introduced him and then I was sitting in a chair slightly back, you know, from the podium on the, uh, from uh, on the stage. Um, and he was in a conversation with me and he kept turning back, right, to refer to something I'd said in the introduction. That way, he was trying to talk to me and, you know, he wasn't talking into the microphone and he wasn't like, you know, but it was because we were in a conversation, exactly as you say. And he was, um, he was trying to continue the conversation. So I wanted to pick up on, on two things. Now I'm forgetting one of them. So one, Rachel, you mentioned, um, you know, that, that he did have so many people for tea and that this, you know, the interaction that you had with your dad was, was different, but I, I would also add even the standard tea, which is what I got was amazing. Right. And, and he was so generous with his time and this beautiful tea set, and he would invite you in and um, and, and he, he, he met you where you were and he, he met everyone where they were, you know, and, um, I tweeted out this photo of, of him reading a book to my son and niece when they were about four or five. And he was reading the book because my son had climbed under his coffee table and, you know, and he was trying to lure him back out. And, um, and, uh, and I think many clerks have stories, not as heartwarming and heartbreaking as yours, but of, you know, the justice really embracing, the families and uh, and and being so generous in that way that that I think we all really um, appreciate. Um, and then the other thing I was going to add was um, one of the things that the justice does at his uh, uh, at his reunions is um, he he goes through term by term and he and he reminds everyone and tells everyone about a particular thing that happened during that term and he names the clerks and he he exclaims over a particular case or incident and um, and he he does this literally he goes term by term and he makes everyone feel a part of the story and everyone feel a part of his world as a justice and and the life of the chambers and it you know it brings you together with the other clerks so i have relationships friendships with people who you know i know only because they were other briar clerks and i met at the 
at the reunions and, and heard these stories about them. But it also just, it, it goes back to Vince, what you were saying, right? He's always paying attention. Um, and he, and he, he wants you to know that. And he wants you to know that you're an important part of his life. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that's just, crucially important. I'm going to say one last thing, and then um, people can offer last uh, last comments for our last couple of minutes. So I, I, my last comment would be, um, Rachel, you said this before about like, how could they not, you know, like him? How could they not have affection for him? Um, the, the, the news media keeps replaying the clip of he and President Clinton walking into the Rose Garden when he was announced to be the nominee. And the smile on his face is just so genuine. I mean, it is just genuine. He's full of joy. He's not trying to hide it. He doesn't think it's inappropriate. He doesn't think it lacks dignity. He just is full of joy. And he had the same smile, you know, at the White House last week when he, you know, gave his, his retirement speech. And after 27 years on the bench, I don't think it ever rubbed off, right? That he was in this place and that he was getting to do this role as a public servant, as you said, Rachel, um, and uh, and and to work for people. And um, that joy is just, it's just, it's infectious. And, um, and it's something that I will always um, keep close about him. Who wants to go next? Last remarks. I think you know, several people have mentioned his optimism, uh, but the thing that's really great about it, Risa, as you've suggested, is it was contagious and infectious. Uh, you know, he he was not a backslapper. Uh, he is not someone who would roar with laughter, uh, you know, really loudly, to or would uh, you know tell uh, the funniest jokes. Uh, but at the same time, he was someone who could communicate his enthusiasm for basically everything he was doing for life in general, and the hope that you know things could get better. And I think you know that's uh, that as a just as a kind of human quality. I think that's very undervalued. Yeah, I think that's a great place to end. I mean, his legacy in the law is considerable. Um, but his legacy as a human being is equally so, and I think we all shared in it. One, one other part of his legacy that I think people don't talk about enough is diversity, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, back to when Dan was clerking for him on the Court of Appeals, um, he always really cared about hiring um, a diverse group of people um, to work with him. Um, women, uh, racial minorities. I mean, every year there were, you know, it was a diverse group in his chambers, and um, uh, you know, he cared about that deeply and long before it became popular to focus on diversity in hiring. And so, obviously, it was great for us, right? And and for me personally, I never would have clerked on the court if he didn't care about diversity. Um, but uh, I think more importantly, um, he believed it was important for him to have different experiences and different viewpoints coming through chambers. And because he was focused on it so long ago, we had now have all these people who have come of age, who, um, who uh, are at sort of the highest echelons of the legal profession who clerked for him. We have the Dean of UVA Law School. We have Jenny Martinez, who's the Dean of the Stanford Law School. We have Neil Katyal, who uh, was the former Solicitor General. We have, Katanji Brown Jackson, perhaps you've heard of her. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a legacy that he will leave. He has sent a diverse group of people to participate in our democracy and to operate at the highest levels of our legal profession that will, uh, and that will outlast his time on the bench for sure. So um, I, I think that's a great place to end. And I will say we we did get a, a comment in the, in the Q&A about, um, you know, the importance of Different kinds of experience to judging, and uh, and I think he he has launched. I think that's true not only to judging but to lawyering and to leadership, and and I think he has uh, launched the careers of so many, uh, 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 you know, who are who are an incredibly diverse bunch. And I think it also leads, and I think the commentator uh, who shared this probably intended for it to do so, you know, to questions about the nomination and who's going to come next and what kind of people do you do you put on the bench and how do you think about that question. Um, so let me just say 
Uh, thank you to each of you. This was just a, a wonderful conversation and I appreciate you all being here and, uh, and thank you to our audience um, and, uh, and thank you to Justice Breyer for leaving uh, such a beautiful legacy. So have a good day, everyone.